So we are delighted to have today with us in our Bar Ilan University Vision Science Seminar, Professor Pawan Sinha from MIT. Pawan Sinha is a tenured, um, tenured professor of vision and computational neuroscience in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. He received his undergraduate degree in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi and his master's and doctoral degrees in artificial intelligence from the Department of Computer Science at MIT. He has also had extensive research days at UC Berkeley, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, the Sarnoff Research Center in Princeton, and the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen, Germany. His research interests span neuroscience, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and public health. Using a combination of experimental and computational modeling techniques, research in his lab focuses on understanding how the human brain learns and interprets and recognizes complex sensory signals such as images and videos. His experimental work on these issues involves studying healthy individuals as well as individuals with atypical development such as neurological disorders as autism or vision following congenital cataract removal. His goal is both to investigate the nature and development of human visual skills as well as to create more powerful and robust AI systems. Professor Sinha founded Project Prakash almost 20 years ago in 2005 with two main objectives, to provide treatment to children with severe visual impairments and also to understand mechanisms of learning and plasticity in the human brain. This pioneering project has provided insights into several fundamental questions about brain function while also transforming the lives of many blind children by bringing them the gift of sight. Professor Sinha received many prestigious awards, including the Pissart Vision Award from the Lighthouse Guild, the Asia Game Changers Award, the PCASE Award, which is the US government's highest award for young scientists, the Trolland Award uh, from the National Academies and the Oberdorfer Award from the Arvo Foundation. And I hope I pronounced all of these correctly. He published in top leading, he publishes in top leading journals um, as Nature Science, Nature Neuroscience, PNAS, the Proceedings of the Royal Society and many others. His research is often covered by the media, including by the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, ABC News and other media outlets. He is also active in communicating scientific findings to the general public on a broader scale and has therefore written a series of newspaper articles on various aspects of normal and abnormal brain function. He has served on the program committees for prominent scientific conferences on object and face recognition and is currently a member of the editorial board of the ACM's Journal of Applied Perception. He founded Imagen Inc a company that applies insights regarding human image processing to challenging real world machine vision problems. Imogen Inc. was the winner of the MIT Entrepreneurship Competition. Professor Sinha was also inducted into the uh, Guinness Book of World Records for creating the world's smallest reproduction of a printed book. So without further ado, I would like to thank you, Pawan, for joining us. And we're looking forward to hearing about your exciting research today. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, that was such a warm introduction. Um, it, it, it's good to have a friend like you, Sharon, to, to, <laughs> to be introduced. Um, I'm looking at the at the array of faces uh, in front of me on the on the screen, and it's really remarkable how many scientific heroes of mine are in this in this collection. How many mentors? How many uh, beloved colleagues? Um, so this is truly uh, a privilege, and I know that it's customary to use those words, but truly on this occasion, I sincerely mean it. Um, so happy summer solstice for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, the longest day uh, of the year today. Um, and I want to share with you some of the work that, uh, that my lab has been doing over the past couple of years. I would say that this is uh, a somewhat new line of research. We are still investigating it. Um, and let me start by 
sharing um, these famous words of, uh, just give me a moment, let me get that up. Um, these famous words that I'm sure all of you recognize, words from William James, the baby assailed by eyes, ears, nose, skin, and entrails at once, feels it all as one great blooming buzzing confusion. And William James uh, is uh, using this to describe what he thought was the, was the sensory experience of the, of the neonate. The question that fascinates me, and of course, many, many other labs around the world is how this blooming buzzing confusion gets transformed into an organized sensorium. This is the big question of, of development. Um, and we are trying to take little steps, baby steps very appropriately um, to try to get at this, this question. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to pursue uh, these questions at MIT, which has been home to me for many years. I was a student uh, at MIT and then a postdoctoral fellow. And then after a brief stint at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, um, I was called back to serve on the faculty uh, in brain and cognitive sciences. Um, and I'm sure many, if not all of you have had uh, uh, have had a chance to visit uh, MIT. MIT is often referred to as the Times Square of science. If you stand here long enough, you will see everybody who has an interest in science come by. Um, so the, the broad category in which I would classify the work that we do would be these three. We are interested in typical development. We are uh, interested in deviations from the typical path of development. And uh, given my training in computer science, we are also interested in computational development or making models of development that are uh, computationally precise. As Sharon mentioned, uh, the atypical development component of our work uh, by and large takes the form of Project Prakash, although we also have a parallel effort on autism, uh, which is its own kind of atypical development. But here, uh, let me focus on Project Prakash. So I'll share with you just a few slides to give you some background at the risk of repeating material that many of you already know, uh, just some motivation and background to Project Prakash, and then we will launch into the specific question that we are, we've been interested in lately. The background to Project Prakash that motivated this whole effort is this. Um, the incidence of childhood blindness in India is huge. Uh, it's at least three times as high as it is in the West. And I suspect that's a severe uh, underestimate. The, num the actual numbers are probably much worse than this. Um, the various kinds of factors that lead to childhood blindness in, in India, um, conditions like corneal scarring that you see on the left, uh, congenital cataracts that you see in the eyes of the child on the right, various kinds of retinal dystrophies, various kinds of infections that can in fact be easily treated if caught early enough, but if left untreated, they can progress to blindness. And even maternal infections like the uh, congenital rubella syndrome. Uh, so if the mother is not vaccinated against rubella, then an infection uh, uh, during pregnancy can lead to the child being born blind or being born deaf or many other uh, challenges. Given these kinds of factors, it turns out that a very significant proportion 
of childhood blindness in India is either preventable or even treatable. But most of the of these children, unfortunately, stay blind their entire lives. They never receive treatment because of either uh, lack of access to medical care or lack of financial resources, or even just lack of awareness that the condition is treatable. The parents simply might not know that they can in fact uh, get help for the child. Uh, and these children staying blind causes severe hardship uh, for them. These are a few of the facts and figures um, about childhood blindness in, the, in India. The lifespan of blind children is significantly less than the lifespan of sighted children. So on average about 15 years shorter. Childhood mortality amongst blind children is sky high, fewer than half of children born blind live to see their fifth birthday, according to the WHO. Um, the educational prospects are very dim, uh, less than 10% get any kind of education and their prospects for financial independence later on in life to gain gainful employment Okay, so I was saying that this is the pressing humanitarian need we are going after to identify and provide treatment to curably blind children. Um, and in this humanitarian mission uh, is this amazing opportunity uh, because we get a window into early visual development. So for a congenitally blind child, right after surgery, from the moment the bandages are opened, you have a chance to study how vision develops. So seeing this uh, incredibly fortunate uh, combination of the humanitarian need on the one hand and the scientific opportunity on the other, several years ago, we started Project Prakash. Prakash is Sanskrit for light and that word captures the twin missions of the effort to bring light into the lives of blind children and in the process to also hopefully illuminate some of the mysteries <clears throat> of visual development. So Project Prakash, very briefly, is uh, set up as a three-part effort. The logistically most complex part is outreach, finding the children who can be treated. Um, so we have an active outreach component where teams uh, of field health workers go far and wide into, into North India to find children who are candidates for treatment. The children are then brought to New Delhi where they undergo very high quality uh, ophthalmic surgeries and following surgery we have the chance to undertake research with the goal, the high level goal, being to study visual development after uh, after the onset of, of pattern vision. So what we want to do as part of that goal is to examine what is the status of vision in a child like the boy that you just saw after surgery. So for the first several years, in this case, the boy was about 10 years old at the time surgery was provided. What is the status of, of vision in such a child uh, following surgery? And how does uh, his visual status differ from the visual status of a child who has had vision from the outset? Now, in thinking about the differences in the visual statuses of these two kinds of children, quite justifiably, our attention would go to this early part of their developmental history. So, because that is the starkest difference between these two kinds of children. One child did not have access to high quality vision, um, the other child did. Um, and maybe much of the difference that we see later on following surgery in a Prakash kid relative to a normally sighted kid can be attributed to just that, uh, that difference in the early visual experience. 
but the premise for today's talk is, is a different one. And the premise is that in addition to this difference, perhaps it's also worth considering this difference. So what are the differences in the visual experience, in the kinds of visual experiences these children, the Prakash children are having at the onset of their, of their visual journeys? Um, might there be systematic differences in these two components? So even setting aside the visual deprivation that the Prakash child has suffered, just at the outset of their visual journey, is the Prakash child experiencing visual information that's quite different from the visual information or the visual experience that a normally sighted child has? And might that also contribute to some of the differences that we see? Um, so whereas the first kind of difference relates to the deprivation of early experience, the second kind of difference relates to distortions of input, so differences in initial experience. And as I said, it may be the case that all of the, of the differences in the visual status of a Prakash child relative to a normally sighted child can be attributed to the first, to just the deprivation that the Prakash kid has suffered. Um, and the second idea that there might be differences in the initial experiences of the Prakash child that might be entirely wrong, but we feel that it's it's a avenue worth exploring. Uh, there are some interesting issues here, um, and the the fanciful title that I've given to to, to today's talk refer refers to the idea that maybe subtle differences in the early experiences of the Prakash child and a normally sighted child. So if you look at the second one, the early differences might have some impact that's magnified over, over the developmental time course. So kind of like what Lorenz talked about in the context of chaos theory, that the flapping of a butterfly's wings in the Amazon rainforest can eventually through some nonlinear effects lead to a hurricane in the North Atlantic. So, so by analogy, what we're saying is that maybe initial differences in the quality of visual experience, Prakash children are experiencing relative to normally sighted, may have some uh, bigger impacts on their performance later on. So what I'll, what I'll try to do in this, in this talk is take you through three studies, uh, two related to vision and one related to audition, because we believe that this idea might have relevance, not just for understanding visual development, but also for other sensory modalities as well. Two of the studies have been published. The first one <clears throat> in uh, PNAS uh, a few years ago, the second one on audition just uh, about a month ago in developmental science, and the third one is still in progress. And perhaps <laughs> one or more of you might be invited as reviewers for, for the third study. Um, I want to acknowledge the amazing group of people who have coalesced to address these questions. And I know that uh, a couple of them are in the audience. Uh, Shlomit and Sharon uh, are both in the audience, I believe. But it's a, it's a really wonderful team. Uh, we can talk about having joy in one's life derived from uh, the colleagues that one works with. And these are truly uh, those kinds of colleagues. Um, it's a really diverse group. One kind of diversity that I want to point out is simply the diversity in ages. The youngest member of this group is 20 years old and the oldest is 97 years old. <laughs> Quite remarkable that the 97 year old uh, Sid Diamond 
uh, he is just as active as any of the rest of us, perhaps even more so, comes into work every day. Um, another kind of diversity in this group is diversity in nationalities. Uh, the, at least six nationalities represented in this, in this collection. Um, two other people that I want to, to acknowledge as having guided this work and a lot else in my lab's work are these. Dick Held, um, who was the chair of our department for several years and then uh, became an honorary member of the lab for, for several years. He, he accompanied us to India for Project Prakash uh, and passed away at the age of 94. Um, just a truly remarkable and wonderful person. And Oliver Braddock, who was also such an inspiration and he had an impact on my life in ways that uh, some someday when we meet in person, I'd be happy to go over, but impact that goes beyond just science. Uh, he, he changed how I view uh, science and the pursuit of things like publications and scientific laurels. Um, it, it was really a, a privilege to know both of these people. Um, so with that, let me launch into, into the first study in exploring butterfly effects. And this study starts with the arrival of this young child whose identity along with the identity of his father, I have blurred out in this, in this image. So this is RK who came to us uh, from Washington DC. His parents were worried that he, he was having a hard time making and keeping friends in school and on the playground. And because they had come across some articles in the popular press about my lab's work on face recognition, they requested that we examine the child to assess uh, his face recognition abilities. So we of course invited the child in. Uh, he was 10 years old at the time we met him and running him through a variety of, uh, of visual tests, we found that indeed consistent with what the parents suspected, most aspects of his visual abilities were near normal, uh, all of them shown in green, but face identification seemed to be compromised. And that of course led to the question of why that would be. Why is face identification in particular affected uh, in RK? So we, we took a visual history from the father and we learned something quite interesting. And that was that RK had been treated for congenital cataracts at the age of four and a half years. So RK had been born in China. He was born with cataracts and because the one child uh, per family policy was in effect at that time. Uh, RK's parents unfortunately gave him up to an orphanage so that they would have a second chance for having a child, hopefully without any, any challenges. So RK grew up in an orphanage uh, that uh, about four and a half years later managed to get RK treated, surgically treated. And then a year and a half after that, RK was adopted by this American family and brought to DC. So why might RK uh, experience face recognition difficulties? Well, one possibility uh, captured in, in this quote from Chuck Nelson's paper is that maybe there was a sensitive period or there is a sensitive period for acquiring face recognition skills. And because RK uh, had uh, cataracts at that time, maybe he simply didn't get the right kind of experience. Uh, it seems likely that face recognition reflects an experience expectant process whereby exposure to faces during a sensitive period of development likely leads to perceptual and cortical specialization. And 
this possibility may well be be right. I, I think it has a great deal of of substance and merit to it. But it assumes some specialness of face processing. Uh, in the list that I showed you on the tasks that we ran RK on, many of the other visual tasks he seemed to, to be just fine on, but he was compromised on face recognition. So this idea that maybe there is a sensitive period, it says implicitly that maybe face processing in particular is vulnerable, vulnerable to early deprivation. Um, as scientists, we are always looking for parsimonious hypotheses, those that require us to make the least number of assumptions. So in that spirit, we began thinking about, might there be an alternative hypothesis that does not depend upon uh, domain-specific assumptions? And our thinking settled on this progression. So this is, of course, the the progression of acuity for a, a typically sighted child, starting out with really crummy acuity around 20 over 600 or 20 over 800, and then steadily improving in acuity until about the age of two or three when acuity uh, gets to 2020 vision. Now, what is the primary reason why we have this compromised acuity early on in life. One big part of the reason is the poor packing density of photoreceptors in the neonatal retina. So the neonatal cones are immature and in their immaturity, they have large diameters. So their packing density that you see in panel B is much less relative to the, to the packing density in the adult cone lattice. So essentially, the retina is acting as a low resolution information pickup device, thereby compromising the, uh, the acuity that the child can experience. Now this progression of the maturation of cones and the increasing packing density, that happens even if the eye has a cataract. So in a child like RK, by the time the cataract is removed, the packing density of the cones has increased. And as soon as the cataracts are removed, the images that the child begins to register are being registered by this high resolution sensor, leading to a higher initial acuity than what uh, a neonate experiences. And indeed, in looking at the post-operative notes for RK, we found that post-operatively, RK's acuity was recorded as 20 over 40, which is uh, really almost normal. So the hypothesis that we came up with is that maybe this abnormally high acuity that RK had at site onset might have led to some adverse consequences it's perhaps too much of a good thing. Uh, the flip side of this is we are saying that the poor acuity that typical newborns start out with might actually have a beneficial uh, effect. So what kind of beneficial effect did we have in mind? And here I believe you can already intuit what effect uh, this might be. Um, so don't worry about reading all of the text. I've been meaning to reduce the number of words on the slide, but the basic idea is very simple. If you have a really low resolution image, then local patches of that image are not very informative. You look at this little patch and it's hard to tell what this is. You necessarily have to integrate information over extended areas, and then you can begin to make sense of what the object is. So low resolution in the image is essentially an impetus to expand the area of integration. Whereas if you had access to high resolution information, then even in local patches, you may have enough information to do an adequate job of classification. So you're reducing that inducement to expand uh, spatial integration areas. 
and that's of course the whole image. So to this question of why is RK's face identification uh, performance compromised, we are hypothesizing that maybe RK has small integration fields leading to compromised holistic processing and a bias towards local processing. This seems like too much of a case to be building just on, on evidence from one child. So is there any additional evidence aside from RK that might support this, this idea? There is some evidence, some at the moment anecdotal evidence from Prakash, where we also find that the Prakash children uh, exhibit face identification uh, challenges. This is one of the first Prakash patients that we worked with. And in this picture, this person, SK, uh, is looking at a picture of himself with two of my graduate students. And he can tell that there are three people. He can even tell that they're all wearing glasses, but he cannot recognize any of the people, not even himself. And this is a pattern that we seem to find across many of the children that we work with. Um, but even aside from our work, work from Daphne Maurer's group uh, seems to point to a similar kind of issue. So this is a highly cited paper from Daphne's group where she was looking at children in Canada who had been born with cataracts and had been treated within the first year of life. And then she was working with them several years later when they were teenagers. Uh, and they were performing the same different task. You see two pairs of faces uh, in the image here. Uh, the upper pair is a configurally different pair where the features, the local features are all the same, but their spatial positions uh, have been changed. So the eyes in the image on the right are set further apart. The mouth is set a little above uh, the mouth on the left. The lower pair are featurally uh, different faces with locally the features themselves are different. And what Daphne found is that when the task could be done just using local information, the featural differences, the children who had had cataracts were completely comparable to controls, but for the configurally different faces, the cataract treated children were worse than the normally sighted ones. And uh, there are additional pieces of evidence that I will skip just for the interest of time. So to reiterate, our case difficulties in face identification, we believe, may arise in part from not having experienced the visual world in a degraded manner. The typical acuity trajectory provides that opportunity to most children. Can we test this hypothesis computationally? Um, and the computational test uh, conceptually is quite straightforward. We would perform simulations with convolutional neural nets that would be subjected to different kinds of training regimens, some biomimetic and some not biomimetic. And we would study what happens to the receptive field structures when training is with high resolution images, as is the convention in machine vision, versus low resolution images, uh, versus uh, the low to high progression. And here's uh, the basic result. When you train a deep network, with low resolution images that you see uh, towards the right of this collection in panel A, you find that the receptive fields that the network learns are large and they're tuned to the coarse structure of the images. Whereas when you train the network only with high resolution images on the left of, uh, of this collection, then the receptive fields and the, the columns above each image correspond to the top 10 receptive fields uh, for each one of these training instances. 
the receptive fields the network learns after training with high resolution images are small and tuned to the fine grain structure of the images. Now, at first glance, this seems to be a kind of obvious result. Of course, if you have low resolution images, the, the best that the network can do is look for the coarse structure. But can, uh, I, can I ask a question? Please, of course. Sorry for interrupting. I, I just don't understand the idea why the why when when you take a pit ah now I now I understood now I understood. I think I had a, a confusion. Okay. When it's high resol resolution, then it's more specific and then the networks learns the specificity and whereas the image is less clear, then you get something more general. So yes. it's okay, okay, I just yeah. got confused. Okay, uh, no, thank you. Um, yeah, and I should say, please feel free to, to uh, stop and, uh, and ask me any, any questions. Um, thank yes, you, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm, I'm not tracking my, my chat window. Um, so I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, so the reason why I believe that this result is not entirely obvious is that when you present the network with high resolution images, the network implicitly also has access to the low resolution structure of the images. So uh, the network could in principle have discovered low resolution receptive fields. And yet the network falls into this trap of only using high resolution structures and only discovering the high frequency receptive fields, and it does not find any low resolution uh, receptive fields. In order for the network to create these large low resolution receptive fields, you have to place an external restriction on the quality of the input that the network has access to. So you have to externally restrict the, the resolution. Um, additional results, and I'm, I, I know that I skipped through panels B and C, but uh, those are not, not particularly critical for our discussion at the moment. Um, and even these plots, I'm just going to summarize what these plots show, uh, what the takeaway messages are for, for these plots instead of taking you through the details. The first plot makes the point that the low to high progression so going from low resolution images to high resolution images, the biomimetic progression that we call it, and the high to low progression, going from high res to low res images. Even though these two progressions in aggregate expose the network to the same collection of images, it turns out that they have very different effects on the, on the receptive field structures. So they are non-symmetric in their effects on the receptive field sizes. Uh, so it's not just the bag of, of uh, inputs, but rather the temporal progression of the inputs that also matters. Second, even a fairly short period of low resolution training is adequate for expanding receptive field sizes. Um, and the low to high resolution progression is better for enhancing classification performance across multiple resolutions. So across the four kinds of progressions that we considered, high to high, low to high, high to low, and low to low, the low to high progression is better for enhancing classification performance. Um, and I'll just expand one of the plots there. So the yellow line here corresponds to the to the ability of the biomimetically trained network to generalize across different resolutions. And you notice that the yellow curve is better uh, in aggregate than all of the other kinds of progressions that we consider. And I'll refer you to the, to the paper that has uh, all of these details. So the inferences from this work uh, that phase processing difficulties in the newly cited, like RK, may be due in part to the unnaturally high initial acuity. Now, I 
at the outset, I'd said that we want to look for parsimonious explanations that are not phase specific. And this explanation is not phase specific. We are saying that phase analysis may be the victim of a broader compromise of holistic processing. So other tasks that require spatial integration, we would expect would also be compromised if this account is valid. And indeed, in the work so far, we find that Prakash children exhibit impairments in tasks like embedded contour perception or Mooney image analysis and motion coherence perception, all of which require this extended spatial integration. So phase processing difficulties might be just one component of a broader compromise. Additional inferences are that the poor initial acuity in normal visual development may be a feature rather than being a limitation, a bug. And very pragmatically, perhaps machine vision systems can gain robustness by adopting aspects of biological visual development. So what are the implications of this idea? Just uh, very quickly, one, idea is that if the initial acuity that normally uh, sighted children uh, are starting out with, if that's distributed in a normal distribution as we would expect it to be, then children with too high of an acuity early on, so children in the upper tail, might actually be at risk of developing uh, these kinds of uh, challenges in extended spatial integration. So if we could perform this, uh, this experiment of cracking, acuity that children are born with, and then their later performance on tasks like face recognition or embedded contour perception, then we would expect to see, if our hypothesis is valid, we would expect to see a negative correlation. The higher the acuity at the outset, the worse the performance on these spatial integration tasks. It's a very challenging, challenging experiment to do, but hypothetically, that's what we would expect. Um, other implications, how might we intervene at the outset if uh, the data turn out to be um, as we are positing? For children who are starting out with too high of inequity, uh, the logical intervention would be to somehow reduce acuity. And again, this brings up all kinds of practical uh, challenges, but the logical suggestion would be to reduce the, the acuity via forced blurring. And for children like RK, who are now uh, adolescents, what kind of intervention could one come up with? One possibility is to have, uh, to train them on blurred phase discrimination tasks. So many of the face training tasks that I've seen work with high resolution images. Um, but what this kind of work would argue is that the inducement to look at the broader structure of faces would require the, the training to be conducted with low resolution images. And so these ideas, which I went over very quickly, um, they are, laid out in greater detail in this in this paper. This, by the way, is Dick's last paper. So Richard Held, who I'd mentioned earlier, uh, it was a privilege to have him be part of the team while we were discussing these ideas uh, and then to pay tribute to him uh, as his last published paper. So that's, uh, those are some ideas related to visual acuity but maybe there are dimensions beyond visual acuity that this idea might also be relevant for. So specifically color. Um, so we said that the cones in the neonatal retina are quite immature. And of course, cones provide the substrate for color vision. So babies have poor color sensitivity when they're born and color vision matures over the first year. And there's a ton of data to, to support that. Um, these are the kinds of simulations that we've all seen in, in textbooks on, on visual development, where the richness 
of chromatic information is coming over the course of several months. So given this progression in chromatic sensitivity, one might wonder whether the poor color vision at the outset of development might actually have the beneficial impact of lessening the reliance on color cues and that reduced reliance on color cues might provide some resilience to color shifts later on in life. So that brings us to, to study two. And Sharon, let me just do a time check. Uh, so about how, how much longer do yeah. I have? Um, we usually we quite, we're quite flexible, but perhaps, so we are now uh, um, 12 minutes to, um, to your, uh, let's say, um, uh, 9, 9 a.m. <laughs> uh -huh. okay. um, in general, we are flexible, but I think maybe it would be good to get most of the gist um, in the next 12 minutes or so, and then you can elaborate more if people do have to leave. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to do so. <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's study two. And as I said, this is as yet unpublished uh, in progress. So the Prakash children have mature cone receptors at the time of site surgery. Hence, when they gain sight, they immediately begin getting rich color information, unlike a newborn. So the, this uh, figure corresponds to some work that we have done to try to characterize color vision in the Prakash children. And the gist of it is that the Prakash children are essentially normal in their ability to detect the very subtle uh, kinds of colors. So the three pairs of discs that you see on the left with subtle blues and subtle greens, etc their threshold perception of these colors is very similar to, to controls. So they are starting out post-surgery with good color vision. So the experience of a Prakash child is akin to being trained on rich color imagery, while controls have been trained on poor color imagery early in their developmental timeline. So Control children, they trained, uh, let's just say, trained without color for the first several months. And hence, we would expect them to be equally good with or without color information later on. The Prakash children, by being trained with rich color uh, imagery, would be expected to be good with color, but poor without color, because perhaps they've come to rely upon color because they had access to, to rich color information. Um, so for control children, where we are uh, expecting them to be equally good with or without color, that expectation is borne out in our work and many other people who have looked at classification performance of natural images with uh, color and grayscale images and controls show essentially no statistically significant differences. Prakash children, on the other hand, show a marked drop in going from color images to grayscale images. These are mean plots, but it's quite striking how consistent this finding is. So here are 10 Prakash children. The red bars correspond to color images, performance with color images, grays correspond to performance with grayscale images. And systematically, there is this decrement in performance with grayscale images. So at least uh, there's face validity to the idea that maybe access to rich color information might have some detrimental impact on the ability to tolerate removal or shifts of color later on. We can also computationally test this idea that perhaps color restriction early in development may lead to greater robustness later. So here are the training regimens we followed, and this will seem quite reminiscent of the acuity story, uh, and that's deliberate. So we have these four kinds of training regimens. C corresponds to color images, G corresponds to grayscale images. Um, so if you think of the training regimen as comprising two halves, the first half of a C to C training 
would be color images in the first half, color images in the second half. So essentially color all the way through. G to G would correspond to grayscale images all the way through. G to C would be the, uh, the biomimetic version of training where we are starting out with grayscale images and then progressing to color images. Um, and C to G would be the anti-biomimetic where you start out with color images, progress to grayscale images. The G to C and C to G uh, training protocols would expose the network to the same aggregate collection of images, but just in different temporal orders. We can then look at the performance of these, uh, of these differently trained networks. Uh, what you see on the x-axis are uh, the original color images at zero and then color shifted images on the sides. So with the original color images, all three of these networks, the C2C, G2G, and G2C, they all perform equivalently. And that's why the performance uh, crosses are all overlapping. But when you look at the performance of say the C2C network on the color shifted images, you see that there's a significant drop in performance. But the performance of the G2G and G2C, and again, uh, G2C is the biomimetic version, their performance stays essentially stable across all of these color shifts. So showing much greater resilience than a network that has only ever been exposed to full color images. And just for completeness sake, the C to G network, which was trained with the same aggregate collection as the G to C network, that showed worse performance in its uh, generalization ability than the, than the G2C. So there is some benefit in the temporal progression of going from gray to color images. So the conclusion there is that human data from Prakash and computational results suggest that initial experience with achromatic inputs is useful for reducing the reliance on color cues. This perhaps helps explain the clinical data that we're observing from the Prakash children, maybe provides insights into why normal development proceeds in the way that it does of restricting color information early on and then providing rich color later on, and possibly suggests a way to improve generalization of AI systems to make them more resilient to color changes. A small side note, so we've talked about two progressions, the acuity progression and color progression, but we've talked about them independently. But in normal development, of course, these two progressions, acuity and color are contemporaneous. They're proceeding simultaneously as shown in these images. The initial images are blurry and uh, have low chromatic content, and then later images are sharper and richer in color. Um, so what might be the consequences of this core progression of color and acuity? We don't have the answer to that question yet, but the plan is to examine the learned kernels in the convolutional layers of the networks. Uh, with this question in mind, is low spatial frequency tuning coupled with poor chromatic sensitivity just because temporally that is the coupling that nature is providing us. When we have poor color uh, sensitivity, we also have poor spatial uh, frequency sensitivity. So it's low, low spatial frequency tuning coupled with poor chromatic sensitivity and high spatial frequency tuning with high chromatic sensitivity. And uh, you can already kind of see why we would be asking this question because that is the kind of coupling that has been observed for the Magno and Parvo streams. The Magno stream uh, has poor color sensitivity, uh, but low spatial frequency selectivity. And the Parvo has high spatial frequency selectivity and high color sensitivity. So the question is, might that distinction in the two streams have come about because of this 
temporal co-progression of the acuity and color uh, developmental paths. Finally, in just a couple of minutes, I will uh, introduce some of the work on audition. And as I said, this is published. So even if I rush through it, you have a, a source to, to go to for greater details. And I want to especially call out these three amazing uh, colleagues, Marin, Lucas, and Sid. So Sid, I introduced earlier as the, as the 97 year old, Sid is the retired neurologist. Uh, these three individuals did all of the, the hard work on this, on the study. Um, so in looking at the auditory developmental uh, progression, there's something interesting uh, that I wasn't aware of until very recently. So babies apparently have new normal auditory spectral acuity at birth. Um, so it's not that they can only hear uh, low frequencies uh, or high frequencies. They can hear pretty much the entire spectrum as we can uh, as adults. So babies do not experience the initial degradation in, in sound unlike in vision. So it seems like maybe there isn't a similar story to be told in audition as the one in vision. But if one were to go a little further back in time to when the baby is in the womb, then one can begin to find some parallels to the wish, vision story. So here is an, a, a new story about a team that recorded sound inside the womb in sheep. Um, and what they found was that the sounds that the fetus is exposed to are low frequency sounds. The amniotic sac and the surrounding tissues are essentially acting as low pass filters. Um, so the fetus is getting low frequency sound exposure and it's getting the high frequencies filtered out. And uh, other work from humans, not just sheep, has supported that, that idea that by about the 20th week of gestation, the baby has a functioning auditory system, but low auditory frequencies uh, are temporarily privileged relative to high auditory frequencies. The first set of frequencies that the baby begin, becomes sensitive to are those under 500 hertz. Um, so just as in the, in the vision case, we created these, uh, these temporal progressions in the kinds of sounds that our network would be exposed to, uh, either full frequency sounds or just low frequency sounds or the low frequencies to full frequencies and vice versa. Um, and not to belabor the point, what we find is that now in the temporal dimension, so not in the spatial dimension, but in the temporal dimension, exposure to low frequency sounds expands the temporal extent of the receptive fields. Um, and that expansion of the temporal extent essentially allows these uh, units to be able to pick up on temporal structure in auditory inputs that resides over longer uh, time intervals. Um, I'm going to skip through this. And this acoustic structure that lies over longer time intervals carries information about intonation, prosody, and emotional affect. And there are many papers that have pointed that out. And when we look at the performance of the biomimetically trained network relative to, to the non-biomimetically trained network, indeed we find that the performance of the biomimetic network uh, that you see in green, so we are plotting performance versus uh, the cutoff frequency of the input sounds. The performance of the biomimetically trained network is better than the performance of all other uh, networks. Okay, my apologies for the for the rushed job that I'm doing here, but I'm trying to give you a gist of what the basic finding is that the X exposure to low frequency sounds expands the temporal extent, which then very much akin to the phase story uh, 
allows the network to be able to detect uh, structures in sound that reside over longer time intervals. Um, so computational results suggest that if experience with such signals is curtailed, so if you do not allow the network to have low frequency sound exposure, then the network exhibits deficits in prosodic and intonational analyses. We can ask whether there is any echo of this result in, in the clinic. So in the clinic, what might lead to the deprivation of a baby from these kinds of low frequency sounds? So given that we are saying that these low frequency sounds are obtained in the womb, one circumstance where the child would be deprived of this kind of exposure would be in preterm birth. Where the child is put into this rich soundscape too early. So do children who are born preterm exhibit deficits in prosodic analyses? Uh, so when we went looking for the answer to this question, we found to our pleasant surprise that indeed the reports uh, in the literature are consistent with this, uh, with this prediction. It's not the basic auditory thresholds that preterm babies are, uh, are compromised on, but rather their ability to pick up on the low frequency structures in, in sounds. So an implication of this result lies in terms of designing the auditory environment of a preterm baby. So my son after birth had to be in the NICU, in the neonatal ICU for a couple of days. So I got a first-hand look at, uh, at the environment the babies are in. And it's a really soothing environment for us as adults. There's soothing classical music playing. Um, but if there is any merit to this hypothesis, then what we would suggest is that the sounds that the baby is exposed to should be sounds that they would be exposed to in the womb, so specifically low frequency versions of sounds rather than being immersed in high frequency or full frequency information. So to summarize, I presented in a very rushed way these three studies, uh, two from vision and one from audition. And we are, we are continuing to pursue this notion of butterfly effects in development. And Project Prakash provides us a really interesting test bed to try out some of the predictions of this, of this broad idea, because these are children who have had uh, uh, an atypical early experience of sensory uh, stimulation. So there are a few caveats that I should point out. One, the finding that certain aspects of development are beneficial for later performance, as I have indicated in the three studies, does not prove that they are intended to produce those effects. The benefits could be epiphenomenal. And we, in our enthusiasm for the butterfly effects, are drawing this causal argument, but maybe nature doesn't intend this to be uh, a causal uh, uh, relationship. Second, there are many kinds of proficiencies that might not have roots in developmental initial conditions. This is an obvious point, but it needs to be made. Uh, and third, from the AI perspective, we do not yet have a compelling reason to favor the developmental approach over just a brute force data augmentation one. So much of the machine learning work that goes on is just creating larger and larger training sets. And uh, of course, if you have a large enough training set, you can get really good performance. Uh, and we can't defend necessarily going for a developmental progression if you can just throw in lots and lots of data at the network and get good performance that way. But notwithstanding these caveats, we are enthusiastic about this, about this general line of research because it allows us to combine all three of our interests in terms of development after deprivation. It gives us some traction on the question of why my children with atypical developmental trajectories exhibit specific impairments. On the normal development front, it gives us some understanding of 
why might normal development unfold in the way that it does? Um, and then from the machine learning perspective, what kinds of training regimens might help artificial systems gain the kinds of generalization exhibited by humans? So it's a, it's a nice playground for all three threads that have been of interest to the lab. And with that, my thanks to, to Sharon and, the, uh, and everybody in the audience for spending your morning and afternoon with me on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pawan. It was, uh, uh, even with the technical uh, slight issues, it was fascinating, a beautiful work. And I want to invite everybody to unmute yourself and let's give Pawan a big applaud for a wonderful um, uh, talk and inspiring. And I, uh, of course, I'm opening the stage wow. for questions, um, um, but I'm happy to go first. Um, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'd like to ask uh, about the visual aspects. I mean, um, there is the issue of the um, 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 cone distribution and um, the cone resolution and their development. And um, both aspects, both color and uh, visual acuity um, it are also, I mean, I know this is not uh, commonly thought that the rods are contributing to these types of um, information, but do you think that there's a possibility that in, at an earlier stage when the cones are not developed yet, the rods in some way contribute to these, um, to these functions until the cones are uh, maturing? So because it sounds like, you know, the rods would have low visual acuity and stay that way, but also very poor color information. So they could perhaps provide um, um, uh, I mean, maybe synchronization with the, the with the cone system until there is some separation. Although I know it sounds like very peculiar hypothesis, but I was just curious about your thoughts about this. Yeah, so uh, Sharon, that's a that's a wonderful question, especially because just over the past few months, I learned that even in adult uh, vision, rods play a greater role in. Uh, photopic vision than uh, I had thought. Yeah. It's not the case that rods are coming online even when the conditions are uh, mm -hmm. a kind of low light condition, but even during daylight uh, mm -hmm. conditions, rods play an important role. Mm -hmm. which, which makes me think that there is uh, an interesting story to be told about rod visuals, uh, about rod contributions to the development of, uh, of visual proficiency, but we simply haven't uh, delved into this yet. Yeah, so definitely. a very interesting thread, but <laughs> no good answer yet. Thank Uri? you. Okay, but then I have some, a few comments. First of all, the famous uh, figure of the visual acuity development is not so precise because it's measured with only a single letter and not with the typical chart of, we show that basically children up to age five or six still have the, and that time they reach the normal vision. Mm. Second, they don't have, they have a lot of crowding and they don't have effect of counter integration and the spatial interaction normally. And most importantly, we found that they have large perceptive, perceptive field and basically all of this is correlated with the development of the fovea. Uh, at the age of three, they have large perceptive field because the fovea is not really developed yet. But over the years, up to age of five, they have slowly development of the fovea and then it correlates with the development of the visual cortex. And then they basically, in this age, they see more low spatial frequency than the high spatial frequencies. So I don't know how it, you take it in account. So Reed, the, the development of the phobia, so is it more a question of packing within the phobia or a question of the development of the foveal pit or the two together? No, it, it developed the foveal dip and then they have the dip, you don't have the high spatial frequency until age of five, basically four or five. So the, the, we don't have, a, H3 almost, we don't have phobia or very 
only the sign of the phobia. So I, I think people need to reconsider all this story of development because the phobia is behaving like periphery. Mm -hmm. And that's why with this age, if you have amblyopia, you have effect of the periphery in amblyopia, low spatial frequency, high clouding, you don't have high, uh, you don't have contour integration, and many signs of uh, peripheral vision, basically. I see, I see. So if you were to modify the, the plot that I, that I showed of acuity, uh, the, the primary change that you would make to it is that the plateau, the height where the, the curve begins to plateau should be lower and it should keep going until about it's five a, years before it asymptotes? Yeah, it will go to the right. Basically, you start to, you don't see 2020 at the age of, of three, basically. Only 2020, you reach the age of five. I see, I see. And at about, sorry to pers perseverate on this, at about the age of two or three, what is the acuity that one gets to? It's, if, if this is clouded acuity, it's very bad. It's 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or log mile, basically. It's, uh, if we talk about uh, it's 20 to 100 or something like this, basically. They don't mm -hmm. see, but if you show them only single letter, they are much better. So I the see. idea is that this figure that you show it measures with single letter. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, uh, I'll think more about, about how that might impact how we think about early progressions. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank Bapana, you. I have a question. If, uh, Udi, hi. Sorry, yeah. uh, Udi, uh, Eli has raised his hand uh, long ago. Is it okay that he goes before? No problem. Thank Sorry. you. So, Eli? No, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, and I, I'm asking about the color aspect that with the Prakash, the, the cataract kids, they have poor uh, spatial vision, but the, the color gets through the cataract pretty well. So I think that the, that, that is not consistent with the story that, that you uh, presented on that, that uh, um, it may be at the very young age as the normal kid, they have poor color vision, mm -hmm. but as they get quite uh, to, the, to the, the normal development, they have the, the optical thing does not really prevent them from seeing the full range of colors and the richness of colors. It's only spatially uh, limited. So if they get closer yeah. to so, colorful target, they will have good enough uh, color through the cataract. So Eli, I don't think uh, uh, what we are saying is inconsistent with, with that. So. Uh, even though the cataract might be introducing some color shifts uh, more towards the, the longer wavelength. But yeah, yeah. I agree that with a bright enough color patch, the child would be able to, to perceive color um, even with the, with the cataract. So essentially what we're saying is that at the time the cataract is removed, the child actually has rich color information. So when they are beginning to get good pattern information, they also, uh, they also have access to rich color information. And this conflation of rich color and rich pattern uh, leads to this over-reliance on color cues. Um, well, but you could also assume that they learn to over-rely or to rely on the color information because they, they had used it for many years. Mm -hmm. For for whatever discrimination or uh, tasks they had before color, I see. They, I had, see. they had good color and poor spatial. So right. if they efficiently take what they have, they would use the color for that. And okay, so I see. I see. So that, that's a great suggestion, and we could potentially test that out. So yeah. if we were to have uh, an input regimen or a training regimen where you have really poor spatial information, but you have 
good right. average color information. Right. Does that induce the same kind of strong right. reliance right. on right. color right. cues as what we are finding with the full color inputs? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a great suggestion. Okay, one more we thing can... that I think you should um, consider, there's a controversial issue with stimulating uh, children with a, a brain vision impairment, with cortical vision impairment. This has been controversial for many years. It's been shown with many studies that it's really not a good idea to stimulate them in the sense that it doesn't improve their performance. But nevertheless, it's ideas that will not go away and it's practiced widely in many places where children with cortical vision impairment, that is vision impairment from cortical losses, are being stimulated visually. Your cases are uh, eye related, but your concept is related to that. Maybe you could step into this and help, um, hmm. I don't know, remove this thing because humongous resources are going to this treatment that has been proven numerous times to not be effective. Hmm. Ellie, can you say just a little bit about what kind of stimulation the they, CBI they just children have are a, a lot of colors. They, they put them in and they try to stimulate them on carpets with a lot of colors. You know, these are babies. Uh, uh, toys that have, uh, uh, you know, patterns. And the, 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 there's a whole pattern of that. Uh, a whole, you know, it's a philosophy and a, and a, and a, a business. It's a, it, it's a practice of stimulating uh, cortically visually impaired children. And there have hmm. been numerous studies that show that it doesn't work, but there hmm. are some things that don't lend themselves to studies. That is, hmm. whatever the results, they continue to do that. <laughs> I will reach out to you, Ellie, and learn okay. a little more about this. Udi? Sure. Yeah, uh, Pavan, wonderful Udi. talk and really, truly stimulating and ingenious hypothesis. The only question I'm wondering about is uh, uh, in terms of the details, the problem is of course, uh, having similar experience to you with the uh, project Pro uh, Prakash in Ethiopia, uh, most of the kids that we see, we, you can't say that they're totally blind before uh, surgery. And mm -hmm. they certainly are uh, not, uh, uh, the, the vision is, not, is, is still impaired after surgery. Okay, so there's clearly a jump, but the fact is that they uh, usually, prior to surgery, they have some residual vision, typically mm -hmm. those spatial frequencies. So, so the fact is that they, at least from our experience, are able to see the world through a very low pass filter before surgery. Okay, clearly after surgery, there's a jump, but uh, I mean, I mean it, it, you're right about the, the, the qualitative aspect, but I'm wondering about the quantitative, okay? Yes, yeah, uh, so, uh, great question, Nudi. And uh, we have struggled with that too. And the, the answer, uh, such as it is, that we, we've come up with is that maybe there is this kind of a Goldilocks zone. So the kind of experience that say a Prakash kid has prior to surgery, is just too bad. And the kind of experience that they have, even though it's not quite normal after surgery, uh, but it, it's too high relative to where they should be. So they skip this Goldilocks zone and maybe that's what's leading to these, to these challenges. I mean, it, it's hand wavy at the moment, but uh, we can try out uh, again computationally what are the sweet spots? Is there a Goldilocks zone of the kind we are imagining? Yeah, yeah. But the idea is intriguing and wonderful. I really like it. <laughs> thank you, Udi. Good to see you. Um, Gal, do you have a question? You yeah, thank you. Yeah, first I want to say that it's really fascinating lecture and I think it's really quite amazing. And <laughs> what I wanted to ask is a general question. If you have any explanation why why is it that the low to high uh, resolution is the is the best uh, uh, factor to uh, uh, normal development? Um, so 
not very much beyond the the hypothesis that we are putting forth here. That is, it's either extending the the spatial extent of the of the receptive fields or extending the temporal extent of the auditory receptive fields, um, thereby making the receptive fields more sensitive to larger spatial structures. Um, so if one were to only work with small uh, receptive fields, then you are going to be constrained unless you put in some really crazy kinds of, of circuitry. One is going to be constrained to only picking up on fine details. And this is perhaps uh, wearing my computer vision hat. This was one of the Achilles heels of computer vision where we were so focused on picking up these fine grained edges that we were losing sight of the coarse structure of, of images. And these fine grained edges turn out to be very unstable and the, the systems that one would construct out of small receptive fields would be extremely brittle. Larger receptive fields, on the other hand, are a little more stable, and one can actually quantify the stability of, uh, of a receptive field in terms of how much is the output of a receptive field affected by transformations like blur or slight translations of the image or noise. And larger receptive fields are, uh, are better from that perspective. Um, so, so I would think that the inducement to, con to construct these larger receptive fields through this clever design of restricting access to high resolution information allows uh, uh, the biological system to become more resilient to these kinds of transformations. And uh, just one additional side note to that. Uh, I'm sure you've seen these kinds of adversarial attacks uh, that deep networks are sensitive to. So you introduce a little bit of high frequency noise in an image and the network begins to classify an image that it was saying is a, is a panda and it classifies that as, uh, as say, something completely different. Whereas so to our eyes, that makes essentially no difference. And I think our sensitivity to the core structure of images is, uh, is largely to be credited uh, in terms of our resilience to these kinds of adversarial attacks. And maybe you think there is a wider explanation that is something that if you show low uh, frequency, then you encourage the system to think more or to imagine or, and combine between the information you get from outside and the information you think about and some in this way you get a better uh, development i think uh, this is a might be a good explanation mm. that's a fascinating thought whether the ability to merge internal schemas with external input might be facilitated by uh, focusing on low resolution information yeah I, i've never thought of that um, <laughs> that's a that's a great idea um, possibly, uh, but thank you for suggesting that. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you for the lecture. And one <laughs> last thing, if is it possible to get uh, the references uh, for I those will... two articles and also to the article which is unpublished, just to read it? Gal, sure. I will, I will, I will uh, distribute, oh, okay. I'll find it and send it to you. Yeah, yeah. thank uh, you very much. I will send yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'll send you the, the papers, Sharon. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Is it okay? Because there are still uh, more questions. Are you still up to answering more? Or? Yeah, 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 of course. This is okay, such, a, such a rare treat. Okay, yeah. lovely. So, Joram, you're up next. Okay, so I'll try. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I tried to make it short. So, you emphasize the critical role of the initial experience. In the humans and humans and in the model. Now the question: Can this be reversed by additional training? Let's start with the model. So you you can start training again from low to high. Does it work, or the model is already hmm. lost its plasticity in a way? 
And if this is the case, can it be undone in the model and perhaps then in humans? Yeah, it's, that's a great question, Yoram. Uh, and good to see you. Thank you for, for joining the, the session. Um, so with the, with the model, um, we can, I, I think the result, however it turns out, is going to be a little unsatisfying because it would depend on what kinds of learning rates we allow the network to have. If we make the learning rate be really low, say after the initial uh, training session, then no matter what we do after that initial training, it's not going to have much of an impact. If on the other hand, we allow the network to keep keep learning, keep changing its weights, then we, so we can, we can skew the results any way we want, uh, depending on what kinds of plasticity we incorporate in the, in the network. I think the question becomes really interesting in the biological uh, system where you do have some bounds on, on plasticity and it's an empirical question. Do we have enough uh, plasticity in order to benefit from say a low to high progression even later in life? So in fact, the, the one slide that I had about what might be a, a worthwhile intervention for a child like RK and I was talking about these blurry face images and uh, getting RK to, to train on blurry images, it kind of implicitly assumes that your hypothesis will work, that even later in life, if the visual system is forced to work with low resolution inputs, it will be able to, to adapt to those kinds of inputs. But it remains to be seen whether that is in fact, uh, in fact the case. Um, Uri, I believe, might have some uh, something to say here. Um, if he finds that there are training procedures that focus on the low resolution structures of images that are effective even late in life, uh, say for amblyopia. I don't know if you would like to, to say something, but um, your, your, um, to your question, uh, it's a great thought. We just don't have any, any evidence one way or the other yet. Thank you. Um, Elena, do you want to? Uh... I I, have... yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I was thank wondering you. if people born with the cataract so that they reach eye vision soon have probably multisensory integration task. My view is that this blurry phase can be useful to develop multisensory integration. And so vision can take information from every sense and basically develop also, uh, thanks to the information of uh, the other sense, so uh, tactile, auditory, and movement are almost uh, uh, good at born, while vision are not. So maybe this uh, other sensory modality, thanks to the low vision acuity, can help vision to reach, uh, uh, basically, to improve multisensory integration. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so your voice was cutting in and out a little, uh, so I'm not sure if I if I got the the question right. Article but, the question, oh, sorry. is uh, if it is black? Okay. Yeah. So you were asking about whether multisensory integration yeah. might uh, compensate for the. No, 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 no. If yeah. uh, the bloody phase is is due to develop multisensory integration, so people that born with cataract that reach vision soon. Maybe they can have problem in the multisensory integration task because they have not this phase where vision is not good, but can, uh, in which, in, so in ah. which you understood what I mean. So basically, as vision is very strong sensory yeah. modality to make a multisensory integration to develop, we need that vision is not so eager than the other sensory modality. So that's, in, a, yeah, you understand that's a great what, question. Sorry, that's I'm a, great a little question. bit emotional, it's exciting. No, 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 that, okay. uh, that's a beautiful question. Um, so when I talked about the, the co-progression, uh, say the co-progression of acuity and color, one of the co-progressions that we're very interested in is uh, I think what you're alluding to, the co-progression of tactile acuity and visual acuity or auditory acuity and visual acuity. And I think there are interesting uh, things to be to be found there. 
maybe the resolution limits in these different modalities are all kind of beautifully yoked together so that the correspondences between the touch system can be more easily established with the visual system. Um, so intuitively that makes a lot of sense. If you make one system have very high acuity and the other system has low acuity, then perhaps it would be harder to establish that correspondence. So I completely re resonate to that, to that idea. Uh, we just don't have any, any evidence yet. Evidence if the guys with the cataract at multisensory impaired uh, at multisensory skills or not? Because as it, at not this time where uh, the, all the sense are not good, but they are the time where tactile auditory develop while vision develop in one step. Maybe he can have some problem in auditory visual auditory integration, tactile visual integration. Because um, so maybe I don't know if you have tested this uh, this. Stuff. Yeah, so we have tested one fairly limited uh, version of, of cross-modal mappings um, in the context of the Molyneux uh, query. So is knowledge about three-dimensional shape uh, that a, a person has via touch, does that immediately transfer to visual discrimination? So if you're able to discriminate between a cube and a sphere by touch while a person had been blind and then the person gained sight, would they immediately be able to say which is the cube and which is the sphere? So that question we have, uh, we have looked at and the finding there was that immediately after the onset of sight, the children were unable to make that distinction visually, even though they could do so via touch. But uh, I think the question that you're getting at is richer than just this. Uh, so looking at fine-grained versions of cross-modal integration and comparing the acuity in the different modalities and seeing whether the comparability of, those, of the tactile and visual acuity has an adaptive role to play. I think that's a, it's a great question. Um, Thank you. One that we would love to to pursue. Thank you. So, um, Pawan, are you still up to uh, so answer? Let more? me just make sure. So I have uh, <laughs> three more minutes. Okay. So um, Ellie, if you can make your question very short. Um, yeah. It's very hard for me to make it short. <laughs> uh, okay. So the the point that there is a distinction between the low frequencies and high frequencies is somewhat artificial and related to the way you do it. And you mentioned edge images. Edge images seems to have only high frequency, but they really don't. They have the full low frequency. All you need is a small nonlinearity. And I sent you earlier one of my papers, but I added it now to the chat in which I show that uh, high-pass filtered images, which are removed all the low frequency content, are maintaining all the low frequency content by simply passing them through a, a, a nonlinearity that is commonly available in vision. So mm -hmm. the, the question is, why would the visual system depend on uh, separating them rather than processing both the high and the low when they are available. I, I, I fail to see a reasoning for that, except maybe in resources or something of that nature. Yeah, so, um, so again, I, I think we are both puzzling about the same thing. So with inputs that have high resolution information, we also implicitly have low resolution information. Well, I'm saying and even yet, if they remove the low frequency information, if you remove, or if you hyper filter the image, so mm -hmm. you remove the low frequency information, you really don't remove it from the visual system. The, yeah, and the, that we did not do. So we did not remove low frequency information. Right, we just right, yeah. passed full frequency images. Um, and with those images, I, I think as you are pointing out, the network could have discovered these large receptive fields yeah. that could have uh, compared fairly distant regions right. of the image. 
but the network uh, only learns the small receptive fields that compare adjacent uh, parts of the of the image. So it's, it takes an external restriction on uh, the availability of high frequency information in order for the network to discover low frequency receptive fields. Um, so I don't know if that's a satisfactory response, but I'm happy to, to chat further, Ellie, uh, sure, sure, right. given that yeah, we are right next door to each other. The, the point you raised about um, the failure of uh, uh, computer vision by looking at small patches and the failure of the visual science that only look at responses to patches, the small patches, and doesn't talk about how, you know, I always say, okay, with these responses, how do we see the image? Ellie, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Pawan has okay. to leave, and I want to thank him again. So I'm going to have to. I suggest you continue this discussion yes, yes. We're close uh, off. We, we uh, can off even our do it in person. Yes, yes, definitely. let's do that in person. Yes, definitely. So Pawan, I want to thank you again very much for joining us. Uh, on behalf of everybody, uh, it was uh, uh, inspiring and very interesting uh, talk, which I'm sure many of us will take further into. Uh, you know, following on uh, with research and. Um, I also want to say next week we have Dale Perves uh, with us talking about how vision succeeds in a hidden world. I'll send details about that. So again, thank you very much, Fawan, and it was a pleasure <laughs> having you and everybody for joining. Thank, thank you, Sharon. Thank you very thank much, you, everyone.